Now, some time ago, I read about some research that was done in America where they said that in any audience, after 17 minutes, apparently 20% of the audience start thinking of what they're going to do as soon as the talk is over, 20% are reminiscing, 12% are thinking of religion, and 17% are having erotic thoughts. <laughs> so I understand why Ted cuts it off bad. Now, it's a great time to be living in England. Diversity is high on the agenda, and I can tick off all the boxes. I'm a woman, I'm an ethnic minority, I'm a Muslim woman, and I'm disabled. And you may wonder in what way I'm disabled. Well, about 10 years ago, I started developing a very serious hearing problem. So I only have a very, very small bit of my hearing. So I wear two very powerful hearing aids. And I tell people this up front, because very often when they ask me a question, even with the hearing aids, I don't get it right. And they think I'm a little doolally. Uh, somebody recently asked me, how long does it take you to make a curry? And I heard, how long have you been in the country? So I said, 32 <laughs> years. Um, they said, we're not coming to your house for dinner. <laughs> well, um, I came to England, um, you know, 32 years ago when I met my husband, married him in three weeks. And obviously, there was little chance for due diligence because he was looking for a good wife who could cook him a curry. I had never been inside the kitchen. So that was very, very interesting. I'd never obviously... And the three questions I was asked when I came to England in 1978 was... Um, you know, are you a good cook? Which I said, no. Then they asked, does your husband own a corner shop? And I never understood that. But that time, Indian, you know, lots of Indians were running corner shops. And the third question was, you know, being a Muslim woman, do you walk two steps behind your husband? To which I would always say, I walk 10 steps behind him, so he doesn't know what I'm getting up to. <laughs> and I think it, it's kind of, I've kept that up. Now, I have two real passions in life, and one of them is people, and the other is food. So I guess that's why... I have called my talk, Coriander Makes the Difference. Now, being a self-taught cook, I found that I had so many culinary disasters um, that I needed something to put them right. And I found the one thing that really helped me was a herb. It transformed everything. It made the difference, and it was coriander. So when anything went wrong, if I added coriander, it could actually salvage it. And I found that with people, too. You know, whenever there were people who made that difference to me and who made my life special. And I call them the coriander in my life. Um, and they were so different. They were so special. And when I analyzed what they were about, I found the trait that they all had was kindness. And I think kindness is one of the most powerful traits. Even Nietzsche, years ago, argued that kindness and love were the most curative of herbs and powerful agents in human intercourse. So I think, you know, um, that was very important for me to know. But the great thing about kindness is that anyone can be kind. We don't need a high IQ. We don't need a big bank balance. We don't need to be cool and glamorous. And also, nobody ever seems to forget kindness. If somebody's been kind to you, we always remember that. And it brought it home to me 15 years ago. I was with a client, and we were going to different restaurants in London trying to taste different cuisine. So we went to this little Burmese restaurant, which was a small family-run affair, and there were um, you know, probably 10 tables. which was run by a father and son. The older man obviously enjoyed this. He was going to every single table and talking. So when he came to me, he said, where are you from? So I said, I'm from Calcutta. And immediately he said, you know, I'm alive today because of this man in Calcutta who saved my life when he was uh, apparently a refugee from Rangoon in the Second World War, and he came to Calcutta, and he said this man gave him a house. And, and Calcutta being quite a small place, I just said, well, who was the name of the man? I thought perhaps, you know, my family may have known him. And he said his name was Khanbadar Dasani. I said, well, that's my grandfather. And you can imagine, I mean, I was repaid bad after that. I never could go into that restaurant you know, without being given loads of food, and, and his kindness was always remembered. So I think, you know, that's very, very important to remember. Now, we live really in a cynical society where everybody is very skeptical about kindness, and, you know, with credit crunch, with celebrity obsessed. So kindness may seem a kind of balmy philosophy. But in fact, quite the reverse. Kind people are found to be more fulfilled, they're more interested, they have much more productive lives. Um, and so, therefore, there is a real reason to be kind, too. Now, my own mantra, which is borrowed from someone else, is you have not lived a perfect day unless you've done something for someone who can never repay you. And I do follow that philosophy. So every day, it gives me an opportunity to be creative, to be something different. 
And the philosophy really enriches my life because they say the fragrance always stays in the hand that gives the rose. But I hope it enriches the lives of those I meet. And I think all of us have huge opportunities to be kind. I think kindness can be built into a habit. You know, Aristotle once said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And I think with kindness, too, I think the more we do it, the more we enjoy it, the more you want to do it. So I think you know, it's something that we should all practice much more. But in India, kindness, when I was growing up, was inextricably linked with food. Because there were so many people who were starving in India who didn't have enough food. So in our home and in many homes, whenever you cooked, the food that was left over was never stored. It was actually given to the people who were starving or who didn't have enough. And I remember wherever we went, food was such a central part of our life. And when I came to England, obviously there aren't people to feed, but I wanted to use food as a way of reaching out. And my grandmother would always, whenever she went out, cook extra and take in little boxes to the relatives, whoever she was going to visit. And we used to always cringe, but I was horrified. I started developing this habit. So I was making food and actually taking along wherever I had to go. And then I started enjoying it so much that I started taking to big companies and to Barclays where I was meeting someone or whatever. And I think when it went through the scanners, they'd be quite puzzled as to what is going in. But I thought it was working because I rang up the chairman of the company who I'd visited five months before. And the secretary picked up the phone and she said, when are you coming again? We want some more spicy Bombay potatoes. So it did actually, it does really work. And today I thought to myself, you know, there's no way that I can come here and not bring my food with me. And so I actually, um, they say the only thing you get for in life without asking is an infectious disease. So I asked Vanessa, can I bring my wok and come today? So that part of bringing it, and I'm going to cook for you something very simple. But for me, it's part of sharing, of perhaps making a difference, of touching you in a way that I wouldn't be able to otherwise without my food. And perhaps that in some way, it'll enrich your life. You learn something new. And I've actually timed it so I'm going to be able to do it for you. And I hope you can go back and do it quite easily. So it's going to be very quick. And I'm going to be there and doing this. And then you can taste it, which is obviously part of the fun. Um, but the thing with any food that you do, your energy matters. So if you're cooking for someone you hate, your husband, ex-wife, it's never going to taste that good. But you have to also, um, so I'm going to do spicy Bombay potatoes. That's my signature dish, OK? And I've got everything ready. I'm putting on the thing. It's the, I've got oil, the very few ingredients. So anyone can actually go and do it. Um, and I'm putting in some oil there. I've got a mixture here of coriander and cumin and chili powder. And I've got some loads of garlic, which is lovely. The only thing is be careful when you're cooking Indian food, because after that, the smell stays forever. So I wouldn't um, recommend you to go out after having cooked something like this. I'm heating the oil so that it really gets hot. And that's very important. A lot of put, people put you know, things into cold oil. Always make it really, really hot, um, because then it really works well. I've got some mustard seeds. Now, as soon as it's kindly ready, I will, if they pop, then I will start putting all the ingredients. So the main thing with cooking anything is to have fresh ingredients, to really enjoy what you're doing. And it's much more than just cooking. It's about sharing, about sharing kindness, about sharing a meal together. And it's the best thing in building relationships or doing anything. So I really feel food is a great way of bridging cultures and it's diversity at work. Because wherever I go, the one thing I always have in common with almost anyone I meet is everybody loves food. I've still to come across someone who hasn't said that they don't like food. In fact, I've had so many foodies here. OK, it's beginning to, to um, sizzle. I'm putting that in. It's going to get, um, you'll start smelling it. And going to add a little bit more water so that it's done. And a bit of tomato. And um, it's kind of, and all these herbs and spices are really good for your, um, your health and your, it, they've got medical qualities too. And a little bit of salt. Um, I'm going to put less than 
I would normally do that. And since we've got the potatoes ready, I'm going to actually put them in. And then we've got our wonderful coriander leaves, which we're going to add. And just to make sure that it tastes good, I'm going to taste it before I actually subject you to it. Leave that to cook for a little while so it'll soak up all those um, lovely herbs and spices. Um, okay, and that's my cor um, spicy Bombay potatoes in two minutes. And, and I really, <laughs> it's really one of those quick ones, so nobody has an excuse for not cooking and not sharing with others. And um, I'd really like to, you know, end with really saying what Mother Teresa, and I come from Calcutta, and she said, let no one come into your life and to meet you without going away a better and happier person. I don't know whether really they'll be a better person, but I think they're always happier if you've given them some great food. So, um, you know, that is my, you know, the way of actually seeing how one can make a difference. And for me, it's really the power of kindness, coriander, and a walk. So thank you very much. Thank you.